Well, if you have your Bibles today, I want to invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, I want to read in your hearing verses, uh, verses 10 through 12. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 10. And the word of the Lord reads as follows. We're in this series entitled Gracefully Broken. We're dealing with brokenness. Here's what the word of the Lord says. The word says, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, do you know the Lord? Because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Amen. And I want to preach today from the thought, it's already paid. Is that all right? Do me a favor. Look at your name and say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. It's already paid. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord praise today. It's already. It's already paid. As I stand before you today, I want to share with you that there is a confession today that I have to make. I'm a bit ashamed to make it this confession, but they say that confession is good for the soul. So here it goes. This is not something I am particularly proud of. It is something I have struggled with for quite some time, but I, and I want to admit it today and I hope this is the last time I will have to confess and to admit this publicly. I have struggled with something for a very long time and I finally reached the point where I feel that it's time for me to come clean. Tell your neighbor, listen up. I have a problem over packing. What did y'all think I was gonna say? I have a problem over packing and I find that when I'm going places, I have this tendency to pack way more things than I really need for the journey. I tend to be a very organized person and so when I travel, I tend to imagine all kinds of potential situations that could come up, that might come up and I wanna be prepared for any contingency that might arise. I want to make sure that I have an outfit for every possible occasion, morning, afternoon, and evening, for every day on the I-10. Don't look at me like that. Some of y'all have been in that same situation. And I want to make sure that I have products in case there's a mosquito bite or in case I get cut. Or I need to have products for anything that could happen. Well, recently, all of this came to a head when the kids and I were going on vacation and it was like an adventure trip and that the kids were looking for for quite some time day one of the trip we were all scheduled to land board a van at the airport and go to this resort and then we after checking in we were to get on a shuttle for the first adventure of the day which included zip lining and a safari we had about an hour and a half after the flight landed to make it to the hotel and to check in and get back down to the shuttle. It was just the right amount of time, I thought. When we landed, however, we ran into a problem. The problem was that the bus that was assigned to pick us up was not as large as I had anticipated. And the driver was unable to fit all of our bags on the bus. And there we were, the driver, whose uh, first language was not English, the driver and I, and I had a rather testy exchange right there at the bus because he kept showing me this paper from the resort which says that each person should have one suitcase and one small carry-on bag. I saw that when preparing for the trip, but I didn't think they meant that literally. 
Besides, this was an eight-day journey, and you have to be prepared for any contingency that can happen. And to say the least, we had more than one suitcase and one small carry-on bag per person. I, I won't tell you how much, but, 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 because, but because we were in this remote area, there weren't any other vehicles to take us from where we were to where we needed to go. We had to wait for him to make several trips back and forth to, from the airport to the resort and by the time we got there and waited to check in we missed the shuttle for the first activity of the day that the kids really wanted to do they have been looking forward to this trip and this journey and this vacation for quite some time so there we were Josh was angry the girls were crying and Nathaniel was indifferent with his headphones on because I had packed too many bags and I was carrying around too much luggage. There I was stuck with four uncooperative children, unable to move forward and enjoy the experience because I had packed and was carrying around too many bags. It then dawned on me, Mount Eden, in preparation for this sermon, that people all around us are not enjoying life because of the baggage that they are carrying. Perhaps not too many bags, but psychological bags, emotional bags, and spiritual bags. It's, it's one thing that makes my heart break as a pastor, seeing people at the check-in counter of life, unable to move forward and to go to the next level and to enjoy the experience of life because they are carrying around too many bags. And as a result, they are weighed down, they are stuck, they are frustrated, aggravated, and irritated because they are carrying around a heavy load acquired from the choices and the decisions that they made. Baggage like bitterness, resentment, and hurt from past relationships. Baggage from trauma of their childhood or spiritual baggage from a season of rebellion against God or authority. And just like it is when I travel, I want to tell you that when you are carrying around excess baggage it's heavy it'll weigh you down it'll cost you your joy your peace and a season of fulfillment and when the trip is over you will realize that you didn't even wear or use a half of the stuff that you have had have you ever been there have you ever gotten back from your trip and realized that half of the things you packed in your suitcase you didn't even need and the truth is that there are many of us stuck in life broken due to the baggage that we refuse to let go of there might be a someone here today you're looking good on the outside you got a good job making a good money living in a decent neighborhood have all of the worldly trappings of worldly success but on the inside feel this sense of restriction and limitation almost like you can't go on and move any further because of the stuff you are carrying is weighing you down I'm talking to the father whose children rarely see him because he is too busy working but he's really compensating for the emotional scars he feels for his father not being there for him I'm talking to the young adult still struggling with the residue to do of childhood neglect and abuse and the reason you don't trust people now is because the people you trusted as a child betrayed your trust and put their hands on you I'm talking to the woman still carrying around the scars of abuse and neglect and abandonment from someone who didn't appreciate your value or your worth I'm even talking to someone carrying the baggage of church hurt from bad experience with those who had a Bible in their hand, a big old cross around their neck, and a clergy collar who claimed to represent Jesus Christ. But they ended up putting you down in church rather than lifting you up. I'm talking to someone here today who has yet to open your heart to the possibility of loving again after a failed marriage or relationship ended because you are still carrying around the pain of the breakup. But whatever you came to church with, whatever is on your shoulders, whatever baggage is taking up space in your life, whatever baggage comes to distract you from your purpose, your destiny, or your dreams, 
which reminds you of your past. God sent me here today to let you know that God has a word for you. And the word is that you cannot let your baggage get the best of you. You cannot allow what happened to you keep you from getting and going and obtaining what God has for you. That's what Erica Badu was trying to convey in her song, Bag Lady. You know the words she wrote, Bag Lady? You gonna hurt your back dragging all them bags like that. I guess nobody ever told you all you must hold on to is you. One day all of them bags gonna get in your way, so pack light. Tell your neighbor, pack light. That was the wrong neighbor. Tell the neighbor on the other side, pack light. That's what the writer of Hebrews is attempting to communicate to those who receive this letter. The writer of Hebrews is unknown, but the content of his or her epistle has inspired generations of believers for many, many years. With themes such as there's a great cloud of witnesses surrounding believers. Themes about resistance to persecution and faith being the substance of things are hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The recipients of this epistle were a group of Jews suffering under the oppressive might of the, Repu of the Roman authorities, uh, persecuted as religious minorities uh, under the weight of social and religious oppression. And many of them uh, would have been tempted to abandon Christ and return to their old ways uh, with, under the threat of Roman persecution. Are y'all here today? The problem was that the former way of doing things that left them spiritually unfulfilled, it left them lifeless and flat out stuck. Nothing is worse, church, than being in a situation and being in a place that you don't want with people you do not like, doing something that you don't want to do. And while they were contemplating going back to what was comfortable and familiar, God was trying to do a new thing in their life. God was trying to open their eyes to see new possibilities and new vistas for them. The past had become so powerful that it formed a spiritual yoke and created a psychological stronghold in their mind. The law, as they understood it, was a psychological weight of burden that left them burdened by a form of perfectionist religion that could not be fulfilled no matter how often they came to temple. No matter how often they sacrifice, and according to verses 5 and 6, the religious leaders within this system served at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what's in heaven. But as it is, the text says, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better. Somebody say, God's got something better since it is enacted on a better promise. According to this writer in the text, God replaced the old system with a new system. God replaced the old model with a new one that occurred at Calvary, which enacted a better promise. The old system required perpetual sacrifices of lambs and goats and doves with its hierarchies of chief priests and elders, with its corrupted religious elite in a shame-inducing legalistic system. That system was was replaced by a new order that only required the blood of one sacrifice once and for all. I feel like preaching. But in order to receive the new promise, they had to be willing to relinquish the old. In order for them to experience what God was about to do ahead of them, they would have to realize that they could not keep holding on to what was behind them. They had to let go of all of the baggage, the beliefs, and the people that were holding them down. And someone here today is incarcerated in your own life because you keep carrying around people and habits and attitudes and things that are, quite frankly, keeping you down and holding you down. The writer of Hebrews says to us that you should never allow what is familiar hinder your freedom because it not only will delay you but it'll also delay everybody connected to you y'all not here 
we were stuck on vacation and my children didn't want to take all of that stuff they kept telling me weeks leading up we don't need all of this stuff I was the one who felt that we need all of that baggage but because they were with me they ended up getting delayed because of my baggage and our families our households and our friendships and relationships can all suffer due to our own baggage the same way that the mindset of the religious leaders in the text held the potential to hold the community down what they, but these people who wanted more they wanted better for their lives refusal to part with excess baggage will affect everybody in your life but I like what the writer of Hebrews has to say to us about this about addressing the baggage in our lives and the first thing she writes to us is this that if you want to move from brokenness to healing if you want to deal with the baggage in your life first of all don't let guilt and shame wear you down the writer of this text opens by describing a situation in which people would be free from a religious system of guilt and shame either for what people had done to them or for what they had done to themselves listen to what he says he says no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another do you know God it's really a question in the text because they will all know me the text says from the least of them to the greatest now the back right background of this text is this the writer is referring to a religious system in which people were made to feel guilty for their mistakes and made to feel shame for how they lived and for the shortcomings in their lives and the morality police in the text would literally go around inspecting people to determine if they had dotted every moral I and if they had crossed every ethical T these morality police in the temple would go around to see if you had it all together and it caused people to resent religion to abhor the church and to distance themselves from God and I want to tell you it's not unlike much of what we see today where many people in today's context need healing and hope they need life and love but they come to the church and rather than receiving a hope they end up receiving condemnation and judgment and persecution from people who use the Bible to advance their own ignorance y'all not here religious shaming and spiritual guilting causes people to live lives lives of bondage and to be weighed down by baggage either in their own life or baggage that other people have placed on them so many people feel shame in the church shame about being divorced and shame for having a child out of wedlock shame for who they love and who loves them shame for growing up in poverty shame and guilt for things that they cannot control in his book, Healing the Shame That Binds You, John Bradshaw says toxically shamed people tend to become more and more stagnant as life goes on. They live in a guarded, secretive, and defensive way where they try to be either more human on the one hand that is perfect and controlling, he says, or they try to be less human on the other hand, losing interest in life or stagnant or involved in some kind of addictive behavior. Guilt and shame, church, have become heavy bags, heavy yokes that we end up demanding of people. It is exactly the kind of religiosity that Jesus came to get rid of. Jesus came to remove that system of guilt and shame that religious people like to put on other people. It is why Jesus intervened in John chapter 8 on behalf of that woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Her community, the religious elite, the sanctimonious uh, protectors uh, of the religious order were attempting to use guilt and shame and they marched her into the city square. They had taken up stones uh, and they were about to kill her because of what she had done. But Jesus flips the script and he helps the community to see that shame that could be used to kill her was also the kind of shame that would kill them. Jesus said, let the first one of you who was without sin, you cast the first stone. I have I got a witness here today. 
I love the story. But when I was reading it over again, I said to myself, Lord, I just wish that Jesus, before he critiqued the fact that they had stones in their hand, I just wish Jesus had first critiqued the fact that they were looking in that woman's window in the first place. If, if, if they caught her in the very act of adultery, why were they even walking down the street looking in people's windows in the first place? Can I tell you something? I believe the Canton Singers was right. You better sweep around your own front door, honey, before you start trying to sweep around. Shame and guilt can become a heavy baggage, a baggage that weighs down our spiritual and emotional selves. Guilt and shame are toxic emotions that will keep you from being the person that God wants you to be. And I said this on Bible Study Wednesday. I thank God that when we survey Scripture, we discover that God uses so many flawed people in Scripture. God doesn't use a people to perform his will who are perfect and have it all together. David and Moses and Abraham were all people who had flaws and that's good news for me because it means that if God could use them there's still hope for me. That if God could use them then God could use you to be an usher and he could use you to be a deacon and use somebody else to be. Is there anybody here today who can thank God that I don't have to be perfect in order to be used by God. The shame, the shame that has entrapped so many church is not God's will for our lives. God's will is for us to be free. God wants us to be free from the shame and that unhealthy, toxic guilt that binds us up far too often. Shame will keep you in bondage, but God sent me here to tell you that the Lord wants you to be free. And as the writer of Hebrews declares, that when God establishes his covenant with the people, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, do you know the Lord? Because they will all know me, says the text, from the least to the greatest. So if you want to be free, you don't, don't let guilt and shame continue to rule in your life. But secondly, if you want to be healed up from your brokenness, if you want to get rid of your excess baggage, don't let your past paralyze you. And what grabs my attention in the text are the words, no longer. Can the church say no longer? No longer, it says, will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, do you know the Lord? Because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Y'all not here. In other words, it says, when you put, when you give your life over to Christ, no longer do you have to go around policing somebody else's morality. No longer do you have to answer questions about whether you you went to church today did you pray over your food no longer will you have to live like that there is this sense that the writer contends that his audience has got to reach a point where they have made up in their minds that today they're gonna turn things around I feel my help no longer will we allow the tyranny of the past to cause us trauma in the present no longer will we allow the powers and principalities that held us down, keep us down. No longer will we allow what's behind us prevent us from possessing the purpose and the promise that God has ahead of us. No longer am I going to allow haters and prognosticators, people who don't care about me anyway, keep me at a yoke up. But somebody ought to shout no longer and I think at a certain point we must all reach a point in our lives where we decide that we are not going to allow the baggage in our lives get the best of us and become a burden can you say no longer for the third time no longer are we going to allow what somebody said prevent us from realizing what God has already said he says we are healed he says we are blessed he says you're going to be 
first and not the last. No longer am I going to be held down and kept down and put down by negative thoughts, unhealthy habits, trifling people, or toxic beliefs. No longer implies that the writer is saying to us that you got to reach a point where you say to yourself, no matter how bad things were, no matter how long I was in that situation, no matter how bad people treated me, I'm not going to allow low down people bring me down. That is Fannie Lou Hamer said, you got to reach a point where you are sick and tired of being sick and tired and you are now ready to change is there anybody here in the church who can declare that you are not going to allow what hurt you to hinder you somebody shout no longer that you cannot allow what happened to you get the best of you. Somebody ought to shout right there. I don't care what they said. I don't care what they did. You cannot allow what happened to you get the best of you. What a powerful declaration that I am not going to allow uh, what happened to me get the best of me. I'm not going to allow what they did, what they said, what they planned and plotted cause me to give up on what God has for me. I believe he got more joy for me. He's got more peace, more love, more power. Is there anybody here today who can thank God that what's ahead of me is qualitatively greater than what's behind me? There is this sense where the writer is saying that the key factor in recovering from brokenness is a choice. Tell your neighbor, it's a choice. Yeah, it's just not going to happen by divine osmosis. You got to choose better if you want better. You got to choose to be healed. You got to choose to be delivered. You got to choose to be set free. And the reason that's a choice you got to make is because if Jesus doesn't allow our past to prevent him from walking us into our future, you can't allow your past to paralyze you as well. I thank God that Jesus sees my mess, but he doesn't allow my mess. Lord have mercy. Keep me from the miracle that he has for me and I believe there ought to be 30 of you here today who can thank God that he doesn't allow your past to prevent you from walking into your future he doesn't allow what you did keep him from opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing on your life Alfred Korisby Korisby who is an engineer a scientist a mathematician and scholar was fond of saying God may forgive your sins but your nervous system won't and what he was getting at is this idea that when we've done something wrong our nervous system keeps track of it and our nervous system causes us to feel guilty the nervous system will cause you to feel bad because your nervous system is keeping a record of everything that you have done and it'll cause you to feel inadequate on the inside and when that happens we start telling ourselves things that don't from, come from God but think what, what comes from the devil we start telling ourselves you ain't never gonna be nothing I'm such a loser I'm always doing the wrong things I'm never gonna get this right I'm never gonna lose weight I'm never gonna have peace I'm never gonna uh, uh, be able to cover my bills and, and if you thought forgiving other people was difficult I'm finding that forgiving yourself is even harder but the writer here says if you want to move beyond that you're gonna to have to learn how to let that go and forgive yourself listen to what he says in verse 12 she says for i will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And there are many people who can't get the breakthrough that they need today because they are constantly held down by what has happened in their past. Yes, they're in the present, but they still have walking through their minds things that they did 10 years ago. But God sent me here today to tell somebody that when you give your life to Christ, you're going to get everything you need and it's already done once 
and for all. Don't allow unforgiveness to set in because God says that I have come to set you free from guilt and pain so that you don't have to keep beating yourself up any longer. God says in Psalm 103, 12 that he casts our sins as far as the east is from the west. And so you don't have to keep punishing yourself any longer. Because when Jesus shed his blood, he prayed the price once and for all for our sins. I have I got a witness here. By failing to forgive ourselves, these people were unnecessarily carrying around the baggage of unforgiveness that they didn't have to because the price had already been paid. I'm going to close this sermon, but I want to take you back to my vacation. And there, when I was on my vacation with my kids, it didn't get off to a good start. That day, after checking in, I was left with a new dilemma. And this new dilemma was, how in the world was I going to get all of these bags from the check-in counter to our room, which was at the top? Of a hill. We were we were not at some of these nice five-star hotels you all hang out in. This was kind of a wilderness adventure resort. And I was trying to figure out how in the world am I gonna get all of this luggage that I have packed up to that room. And so I tried. I tried to get the girls to help me, but they wouldn't. They were too upset. Joshua was PO'd and Nathaniel was zoned out somewhere with his headphones on listening to God knows what. And so there I was with all of these bags on my shoulders uh, trying to look around uh, all of these uh, bags to get it to my destination when the bellman came up to me and he said sir can I give you a hand with that and I said no and I said no because you know I, I, I'm usually suspicious when I check in the hotels and there's always somebody who wants to carry you they want to help you from the car to the front desk and then there's another guy who want to help you from the front desk to the elevator and then there's another guy who want to help you from the elevator up to your you got to tip all three of these people so I said no I can handle it myself I'm going to carry all of these bags uh, to my room by myself. He asked me several times, uh, and around the fourth time, the bellman said, Sir, can I ask you a question? I said, if you must. He said, Sir, did you pay for the all-inclusive package? I said, what do you mean? He said, sir, when I, when I look at your registration, it says uh, that you paid for the all-inclusive package. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, uh, the all-inclusive package is, is included in that a resort fee, which means that all the amenities and the benefits that come from staying at this resort are included in that resort fee, including a concierge service. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He said, sir, uh, let me take those bags because uh, you are struggling to carry around bags uh, that have already been paid for. Y'all missed your shot. I'm going to get out of your way, but I just want to tell somebody here today who's carrying around the weight of guilt and the weight of shame that you are carrying around baggage that's already been paid for. You don't have to carry around guilt and you don't have to carry around unforgiveness because when Jesus died on the cross, when they hung him high and when they stretched him wide, when he shed his blood, he Pay the price for your sins and mine, and it's already paid for. Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, oh neighbor, it's already paid. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain, and he washed it pure as snow. Have I got a witness here? Is there anybody here who can thank God that I don't have to carry the weight of the world and the pain of my past? Because when Jesus shed his blood, 
the price is already paid hallelujah look at your neighbor say neighbor you ought to thank God because Jesus said come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest take my yoke upon me and learn of me for I am meek and lowly for my yoke is easy and my burden light won't he do it I said won't he do it won't he fight your battle won't he be a bridge over troubled water somebody shout yeah Jesus paid it all it's already been paid you are carrying around a weight that you don't have to carry you carrying around bags trying to figure out how you can carry all of these bags from your past from your family from past trauma when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood he paid the price so you don't have to keep carrying those bags glory 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 Jesus
just bless God with the fruit of our lips. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We are you. We worship you. destroy yokes today in the name of Jesus God someone here today God is in need of a miracle God God bring forth healing in this house bring forth deliverance in this house God bring forth miracles promotion right now in the name of Jesus God we know you can do it because you have done it before you have rescued before you've made a way before you've healed before You've delivered before, God, and our only request today is that you would do it again, God. Lift again, open doors again, move mountains again, God. And God, we're not going to wait until the battle is over. We're not going to wait until the doctor says it's done. We're going to give you an advanced praise. We're going to give you an advanced shout. God, we thank you in advance for victory for healing, for joy, for peace, and for salvation. It's in your mighty and matchless name that we pray. In the name of Jesus, let all of God's people shout amen. Woo! Come on, say amen again. Say amen again. Hallelujah.